Good morning and welcome to Rising. We have a show for you today. Brianna, what do we have? <laughs> On this show, we have Elia Mueller-Rin and Denise Long discussing some recent legislation in Los Angeles that banned homeless camps near schools and daycares. Plus, Julia Manchester and Chris Steierwalt will be back with us to break down what happened in yesterday's primary in Arizona and beyond. But first, Speaker Pelosi touched down in Taiwan and risked a fallout with the Chinese government, all to say this. Today, our delegation, of which I'm very proud, came to Taiwan to make unequivocally clear we will not abandon our commitment to Taiwan and we are proud of our enduring friendship. Turns out it wasn't all for just democracy. The Washington Post reports that Pelosi met with Taiwan's biggest semiconductor manufacturer on her trip. And just yesterday, the speaker filed a report that shows her husband, Mr. Paul Pelosi, sold up to $5 million worth of chip maker stock NVIDIA as Congress prepares to vote on the chips bill shortly. Washington applauded Nancy Pelosi's trip, but pundits were quick to point out that there couldn't be a worse time to provoke China in the midst of what's happening in Ukraine. Robert Ross, senior advisor to the Institute for American Studies in Shanghai, joins us now to discuss. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. All right. So yesterday was basically a 24 hour game of why is Nancy Pelosi going to Taiwan? The whole time she was in the air, people were guessing and trudging up all of the geopolitical context of the last uh, 50, 60 years to try to help uh, us understand. So, you know, what do you make of this trip? Fundamentally, why was this so tense? Why was this perceived as such an, an escalation when ultimately she said very little that seems to be controversial? Well, we have to see this in context of the last three to four years of U.S. policy, where despite our declaratory policy of a one China policy, the United States has broken many of the norms of U.S.-Taiwan relations that go back 30, 40 years. From the mainland perspective, we're eroding the One China policy and we're implicitly supporting Taiwan against the mainland and giving them the courage to challenge the mainland on the One China principle and Taiwan independence. So for the mainland, it's a trend. And at some point, as the trend continues and you push buttons and you challenge the status quo, you, the other side will say it's time to stop. This trend is getting dangerous and we're drawing a line. And that's what we're seeing with Nancy Pelosi. She's just not a member of Congress. She's second in line for the presidency, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the most powerful Democrat in Congress. And after 25 years, she's the most senior person in the United States government to visit China. So for Chinese, this is a, another step toward eroding the norms of U.S.-Taiwan relations where the trend could well lead to, they fear, support for Taiwan independence, and that could mean war. So rather than war, they're trying to warn us, stop your trend, be cautious, this is a serious issue. It's not clear to me what the Biden administration's foreign policy even is uh, on any front, but particularly with respect to Taiwan. It didn't seem like the Biden folks really wanted Pelosi to do this, and then she was gonna do it anyway, but if they, absolutely forbade her to do it. I, I have to imagine she would have taken Biden's call saying you are not allowed to do this. So where does that leave us with our thinking of like, what what is the administration's policy and, and do they want to ease back tensions with China or are they willing, I guess clumsily with Pelosi leading the way, to walk us toward a, a greater confrontation? Well, Biden policy has been a continuation of Trump policy on Taiwan, but even more so. It's been walking a tightrope. On the one hand, improving security ties with Taiwan, economic ties, political ties, while simultaneously trying to avoid a crisis and increase tension in the strait. So from the Biden administration perspective, Nancy Pelosi has thrown a wrench in the works, making it difficult for them to walk that line. Going forward, they're going to try and signal the mainland that they did not expect Pelosi to visit this is not their policy, and they want to maintain stability. The ability to do so, however, will be challenged because the mainland may not stop simply at the exercises we're seeing today, but there could be a longer-term challenge to Taiwan security until they're satisfied they've got the attention of the White House. I wonder 
really clear about what the, the context is here. My understanding is that there was a policy in place that relied on a kind of strategic ambiguity, that the, you know, a, a certain kind of non-committalness about the status of Taiwan was ultimately beneficial to both mainland China and the United States and enabled America to normalize relations with China in the 1970s. And we've basically both been playing this game where nobody says declaratively what it is one way or the other so that nobody has to engage in a direct military escalation. But what has been happening is that certain strategic realignments from the US and its allies in the region are seen as Provoca provoca provocations, and in return, certain um, you know uh, military growth in China, et cetera, is seen as a, provo a provocation to the West. And so, there's a little bit, in a similar way that we sometimes talk about with respect to Ukraine, uh, a, a chicken and the egg situation: who's gone first, and who has really poked the bear, as it were, who is responsible. What is your view on what you know has provoked this most recent escalation and and you know, inspired Pelosi in particular to take this trip? Well, we need to first address what we mean by strategic ambiguity. Mm. This was an American policy saying, should there be war in the Taiwan Strait, we're not sure what we would do. But the mainland and Taiwan should take into account that we might act in ways that are in neither of their interests. Now, this had a way of deterring the mainland because they couldn't be sure what we would do. But it also cautioned Taiwan from being too forward leaning, too provocative on independence because they couldn't be sure what we were doing either. Now, the last four years of growing U.S.-Taiwan security, political, economic ties has de facto eroded some of that ambiguity because our support for Taiwan has become stronger. This, as I said earlier, has the mainland nervous because it implicitly says to Taiwan, we have your back. And from the mainland perspective, that suggests it might encourage Taiwan independence. Now, you're absolutely right. The rise of China has created concern around Asia and the United States about what Chinese ambitions and, and intentions are. And we've drawn closer to Taiwan in part to try and resist the rise of China. Taiwan, if you will, is an instrument of American policy toward, toward the mainland. And in that is a major explanation for the growth of security ties. At the same time, the region is quite nervous. We see an American politician apparently going to Taiwan to grandstand that could cause major instability in the region and could draw such countries as Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, Japan into a conflict which they have no interest in seeing develop. So this has actually not only undermined U.S.-China relations, but undermined American efforts to strengthen its relations with its allies and security partners throughout Asia. Hmm. Well, local Taiwanese people didn't seem to necessarily appreciate the speaker's visit. Here you can see a large crowd gathered to protest Pelosi in front of the American Institute in Taiwan. Despite the critiques, Pelosi explained her decision in a Washington Post op-ed where she slammed China for, quote, intensifying tensions with Taiwan, adding that her visit should be seen as a, quote, unequivocal statement that Americans, Americans stand with Taiwan, our democratic partner. However, the former United States ambassador to China, Max Baucus, warned that Pelosi's trip could be provoking Beijing too much. Let's watch. And really what this is doing, it's, it's pushing the uh, uh, support of democracy a little closer to um, crossing the line into independence. That's the real problem here. And the more that uh, Taiwan will not formally declare independence, uh, that would be a disaster. But the, they're going to get close to it. If they get too close to it, uh, China has no recourse but to take action. This is uh, existential to China. It was driven home to me when I was serving there. T Tibet, um, Taiwan, Hong Kong. It's there's just not it's non-negotiable, and we're we are playing with fire, but we can get pretty close to the line. And Pelosi is pushing us much much closer to recognizing uh, Taiwan as an independent as an independent country. And once once we get close, once we get there, um, we're, we're going to pay a price. That's a member of Pelosi's own party. Pretty harsh condemnation. What's your response to that? I'm on the same page as former Ambassador Baucus. Um, this is, if you will, poking the bear. Everyone wants to support Taiwan. Everyone is supportive of democracy on Taiwan. Everyone is appalled by the trends in mainland domestic politics. Nonetheless, actions have consequences. There are no free lunches out there. And one has to ask, to what extent is 
is uh, Senator Pelosi actually supporting democracy to a significant degree when U.S.-Taiwan ties are far more important in security, political, and economic realm to her contributions at the margins at best. But we can see the cost that she's incurring for the United States by the rising U.S.-China tensions, tensions in the region. And so if you do a cost-benefit analysis, it's very hard to see why she's doing this and what the upside is. Well, to what do you attribute the fact that you know 26 Republicans signed a letter in support of Nancy Pelosi? There are some really odd bedfellows that are coming out of this conflict. What do you think is motivating both Pelosi and those who would support her? And how much does this have to do with the chips bill and the fact that so much of the semiconductor industry is based in Taiwan? Well, I think for many Republicans, this is a way to box Senator Pelosi into a corner. Now that you said you're going, we're going to hold your feet to the fire and make sure you go, and we'll charge you with weakness should you decline. And so they're quite happy to see the Democratic Party um, torn up in knots over this visit. Others will say, well, once she announced her visit, it would show weakness to not go and to change her plans. And so they're saying, we're glad she went. Having said that, it would have been difficult for her to decide not to go and for the administration to, to tell her not to go. But she could have handled this in ways that would have been less provocative. But the grandstanding in Taiwan only made it more likely that the Chinese will raise the tension, more likely that U.S.-China relations will escalate, and less likely the United States and China can cooperate on, on North Korea, on Iran, on climate change, on other issues that are important. To the extent so that U.S.-China will, yes. And what about the semiconductors aspect of this, that conversation? What do you think will come of that, and, and, and what was Pelosi's thinking there? Um, I don't think she was thinking very hard about legislation at this point. Uh, the legislation is quite helpful. The United States does need to have an autonomous semiconductor industry. And so the Biden uh, plan and the um, passage by the, by the Senate is very valuable in this one. Um, but her visit was simply to say that U.S. and Taiwan should cooperate in semiconductors. That's long U.S. policy. And so she's meeting with one of the largest multinational corporations in Taiwan. That's not unusual for any delegation. Um, and um, more of concern is her meeting and her op-ed and her um, grandstanding. That's a greater concern. Well, that's what is just so confusing. I mean, I, there are, you know, people are making inferences about the fact that her husband stole off uh, in a large number of stock and stands to profit from some of these political machinations. But the, the, the dots are not being connected specifically. You know, obviously, we're talking about the chips bill now because the COVID supply chain crisis really exposed the vulnerabilities and our ability to you know, make all of the things, computers, phones, uh, high, uh, high tech, uh, everything that requires these, th these chip technologies. People have kind of woken up and realized how vulnerable America is in many respects because we've offshored so much manufacturing. This is, this is central to all of this, but the, the, the pieces seem not to be connected with Pelosi's visit. How does Pelosi's visit to Taiwan and this factory affect the uh, support of legislation back home, the ability to get the funding to actually build the plants in Ohio that are kind of earmarked for this bill but not fully funded? I mean, it does seem to be largely in the realm of inference. You know, we're talking about all these things at once. This is the geopolitical context here. But we're still kind of thin on explanation for why Pelosi would choose to take this risk right now against the advice of the president of the United States and in the middle of um, what could erupt into a geopolitical conflict that's very similar in its posture to many folks to what's going on in Ukraine and causing so much trouble for the Biden administration there. I think we would be giving her too much credit to say that she saw her visit as instrumental in getting the chips bill passed. It was pretty much a done deal, a question of timing, um, long before she had left. Um, the question you ask is, why is she going? And that is a critical question. Um, she has a safe seat. She's going to retire soon. She has no political calculations. This is a minimal at best contribution to U.S.-Taiwan relations. So one can only imagine that her real incentive is to establish her own credentials as a supporter for democracy. This may be a legacy issue. She wants to go down in history as a democracy supporter. But of course, mentioned earlier, actions have consequences. And it seems that, the, that her own personal objectives have gotten in the way of American foreign policy.
I uh, was on a radio program yesterday, a California-based radio program, and the host speculated that perhaps she wants to shore up support among uh, Taiwanese, uh, people of Taiwanese origin who live in her district in case uh, she wants to pass the baton to Chelsea. Or her, I'm sorry, not Chelsea Clinton. What was Nancy Pelosi's daughter's name? Christine. Christine. To Christine. So, all right. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And I look forward to your radar next, Brianna.